Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar hosted by the Health Effects Institute in Boston, Massachusetts. My name is Anna Moon van Erp. I am the Acting Director of Science at HEI, and I'm pleased to introduce today's webinar. Today, we are featuring six travel awardees who were selected to present a poster at the 2020 HEI Annual Conference, which was to be held in Boston in April. This is the third year that HEI has held a competition to engage graduate students or postdocs at academic or research institutions in North America or Europe by presenting at our conference. They are invited to submit an abstract about their work on air pollution and health. Selected abstracts are then featured in poster sessions during the conference. Because the awardees were deprived of the opportunity to present posters in person this year due to the pandemic, we are excited to provide this virtual opportunity for them to share their work today. Before we proceed to the presentations, I would like to congratulate the awardees on behalf of all of us at HEI. Also, thanks to Eliane van Vliet and Paula Vipant, who were the conference organizers, to Robert Shavers, who made this webinar possible, and in particular to Joanna Kiel, who managed the travel awards process and organized this webinar. Without further ado, I will now give the floor to Joanna Kiel, Research Assistant at HEI, who will run the webinar. Joanna, please. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. As Anamun said, I'm Joanna Keel. I'm a research assistant at HEI, um, and I organized the travel award selection process back at the beginning of the year. Um, and so I am so glad that we finally have the chance to hear from our six awardees today. Usually, uh, we award three students or postdocs with the travel award, but since our annual conference was set to take place this year in our hometown of Boston, we decided to expand the award to include three more recipients from around Massachusetts. Um, so our awardees for 2020 are Laura Matchett of McMaster University, Dr. Shingye of MIT, Matthew Raifman of Boston University, Dr. Yan Lin of Duke University, Dr. Jia Yuan Wang of University of Massachusetts Amherst, and Dr. Fanas Fuladi of University of North Carolina Charlotte. So without further ado, I will pass it over to our first speaker of the day, uh, which is Laura Matchett. Um, so as Laura prepares um, her screen share, I'll tell you a bit about her. Laura is um, a third year chemistry PhD student in Dr. Sarah Styler's group at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario. She completed her honors undergraduate degree in chemistry at the University of Calgary in 2013. Her graduate studies started at the University of Alberta before moving to McMaster in September 2020 to follow her supervisor. Her current research project fo focuses on investigating the interactions of trace gases with non-exhaust particles and how this may affect local air quality. Thank you, Laura. Thank you very much for the introduction um, and thank you to HEI for giving me the opportunity to present my research today. Um, so today I'm going to present my research on the reactivity of breakware in the atmosphere. So um, in the atmosphere, one of the large components of air pollution is particulate matter. Um, and this has been linked to adverse health effects, including cardiovascular and respiratory illnesses. So on average in cities, 25% of this particulate matter is from traffic sources. And these traffic sources can be separated into two categories. So you have your exhaust emissions, which comes from your vehicle tailpipe and your non-exhaust emissions, which includes your brake, tire and road surface abrasion. Now, exhaust emissions have been extensively studied and they're currently regulated, and as such, they're decreasing. And this means that your non-exhaust emissions are becoming more important um, in cities. So for example, in Toronto in 2016, um, the non-exhaust emissions were more than double the exhaust emissions. And specifically in my project, I'm looking at breakware, which can make up to 55% of the non-exhaust emissions. Now, studies have investigated breakware and they focus mainly on its emission. So on the amount emitted, the size of the particles and their composition, and also on the health impacts. But we don't know much about what, occur what happens to these breakware particles in the atmosphere. 
So one process that can occur is the uptake of a gas, so the loss of a gas to the surface of a particle. So this process can change the concentration of the gas, it can form new products, or it can change the properties of the particles, for example, its health effects. So in our project, we had three main objectives. The first was we wanted to investigate the reactivity of the breakware, and we used ozone as a pro-molecule. We also wanted to look at the effect of light, um, so if there was any photoreactivity occurring. And finally, we wanted to investigate which components of the brake pad were contributing to the reactivity. So we procured five samples from commercial um, manufacturers. Uh, we had two samples from Napa and three samples from PBR. And of these, we had three different types. So we had a ceramic sample from each manufacturer, a semi-metallic sample from each manufacturer, and finally, an organic sample from PBR. And all of these samples will vary in terms of their composition and in terms of their breaking properties. So the first step was to characterize our break pads. Um, so here what I'm showing is the percent mass composition uh, for various elements determined using ICPMS and total carbon, total nitrogen combustion analysis. So this first graph is for the two NAPA samples. And what we see is that even though they're different types, they're actually relatively similar in composition. But if we compare them to the two PBR samples of the same types, here we see large differences where the PBR samples have a much higher amount of iron and the diversity in the elements is also very different um, between the two different manufacturers. Additionally, we had the organic sample, which has a very low metallic content. Um, specifically, it has almost no iron compared to the other samples. Um, and finally, interestingly, all of our samples had a similar amount of carbon, around 20%. So after this characterization, uh, we looked into the reactivity of these samples. So the first step was we grinded our samples using a wiggle bug grinder mixer to get mechanically generated breakware. We then coated these samples onto a pirate's tube, which is then inserted into a coated ball flow tube apparatus, which looks like this. So the tube is inserted into the portion right here, and it's surrounded by four lights that we can turn on. And then we introduce a flow of 50 ppb ozone at a relative humidity of 25%. And then we measure the concentration of the ozone at the outflow using a commercial ozone analyzer. Now, what one of these experiments looks like. Um, so here again, we have the coated tube. And this black line is a movable injector through which we introduce ozone. So at the beginning of our experiment, the injector is pushed past the coating so that the coating is not exposed to ozone. And we get a baseline concentration of ozone. We then pull this injector back. So now we are exposing the coating to ozone and this first portion is done in the dark. And what we see is a sharp decrease in the concentration of ozone followed by a slow increase up to steady state. We then turn on our four UVA lights. Um, and again, we see another decrease in ozone followed by an increase up to a steady state. We then turn off our lights and finally push the injector back in to get a second dark and baseline concentrations at the end of our experiment. So from these experiments, uh, we calculate an uptake coefficient. So this is the fraction of successful collisions of ozone with breakware. And so it's a measure of the reactivity of our breakware and how much ozone is lost to its surface. So here what I'm showing on the y-axis is the uptake coefficient normalized to surface area uh, for all five of our samples. Now each set of dots represents one trial uh, with blue being in the dark and orange being in the light. And for each, uh, for each sample, we did three trials. And so what we found is that all our samples had reactivity in the dark and they all had an enhancement in the light. So we had photoreactivity occurring. Interestingly, all the uptake coefficients were the same within the same order of magnitude, um, which kind of surprised us because their composition was very different. And we also compared these values to um, particles that our group had previously look at, looked at, specifically road dust, and found that these were one order of magnitude larger, uh, indicating that our breakware, which is probably present in road dust, is probably also contributing to that reactivity. So finally, we wanted to explore what components in our brake pads would be contributing to the reactivity. So we came back and looked at our composition again. And so uh, we had a large amount of uh, carbon in all of our samples, around 20%. And so we picked two components for this, uh, phenolic resin, which is commonly used as a binder. And this would represent the organic portion, organic carbon portion. Um, and we also looked at graphite, which is a common lubricant used in brake pads. 
Um, all of our samples, except the organic, also have a large amount of iron, and this can be present in two forms. So we can have iron powder, and we can also have iron oxide. And here we looked at two different forms of the iron oxide. And finally, um, some of our samples had a high amount of copper, so we also looked at copper powder. So these experiments were performed in the exact same way as with the um, breakware samples. And so again, what I'm showing here is the uptake coefficient normalized to surface area for all the different components. And what we found is that all the components we tested had some degree of reactivity and they all have enhancement in the light. And if we compare to our breakware reactivity, we see that the breakware is more reactive than all of the different components. Um, and so what we can say is that the reactivity of the breakware is a combination of all of the different components we tested. And additionally, it could also, um, you could also have other components that we did not test contributing to this reactivity. We also saw that the phenolic resin was the most reactive component. Um, and as I showed, the carbon content was about the same in all of our samples. And so this could help explain why the reactivity ended up being similar for all of our samples as well. So in conclusion, um, in my project, I determined uptake coefficients for ozone on five breakware samples, and we found that they were all within an order of magnitude. Now, this can simplify the implementation of this process into models, where we could use an average uptake coefficient value instead of having to think about all the different brake pads used in the entire vehicle fleet, which is just not feasible. Um, however, I do want to note that we don't expect breakware to impact model ozone concentration just comparing its magnitude of this process compared to other lost processes of ozone in the atmosphere. Because our reactivity is high, we do think that the breakware particles are being oxidized in the atmosphere. And this may be important to consider if you're looking at the, for example, the effect of health uh, of these particles. Uh, finally, I just wanna note that these results are for mechanically generated breakware, uh, but during breaking, breaking, you can also have oxidative wear due to the high temperatures and pressures and this can change the composition of the samples. Uh, so it can lead to degradation of the organics or oxidation of the metals. And this could change the reactivity compared to what we found. So finally, I'd like to thank NSERC for funding this project, Hexion for providing the cured phenolic resin samples, the people listed here for help with the characterization of my samples and the construction of the coated wall flow tube, and thank my supervisor, Dr. Sarah Styler and the rest of their Styler group for their support. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Laura. Um, I don't see any questions yet in our Q&A box, um, but I would like to encourage um, anyone to um, send your questions into us via the Q&A, um, and we will have Laura answer those for us. Give everyone a couple of minutes uh, to write some questions down. We may um, also, oh, here we go, okay. Um, so Laura, this is a question for you from one of our committee members, uh, Dr. Jeff Brook. He asks, is interest on non-tailpipe emissions overly focusing on metals given the carbon content and its reactivity? Um. Yeah, I think I guess it depends from which perspective you're coming from. Um, so like from the perspective I'm coming from, no one has looked at this before. I know obviously a lot of papers look at the health um, and other things. And I think in those cases, sometimes the metals, obviously if they're toxic metals, they're more important. But yeah, with what we're showing, um, the carbon, the types of carbon may be more important than we think um, if they are affecting the reactivity. Uh, you also do have to, I guess, consider that the oxidative wear degrades the organics. Um, and so because of that, the reactivity may decrease. So you may have less organics in the emitted particles. Great, thank you. Okay, so we have um, another question from another committee member, Dr. Alan Robinson. He asks, wondering about relative reactivity of breakware relative to other types of urban particles. For example, you said that they are more reactive than road dust, is that right? What about other types of particle? How about things like window grime, the sort of stuff that Jamie Donaldson studies? Yeah, so I'm not sure about comparing it to window grime. Um, so far, I've only compared the values to um, what our group has looked at, because then we can do very direct comparison. We're using the exact same instrumentation. Uh, 
Um, and it's more reactive than the road dust. It's also almost two orders of magnitudes more reactive than desert dust, um, which is also commonly shown as a uh, reactive, can be a reactive loss surface for ozone. Um, I'm not sure about the urban grime though. Great, thank you. Um, we have one, well, we have two more questions. The first uh, is from our um, Director of Science Emeritus at HEI, Rashid Sheikh. He asks, how comparable are the brake pads supplied by the OEMs versus those from aftermarket suppliers? He says he assumes that you got your samples from aftermarket suppliers. Yeah, I just went to a store that sold brake pads and purchased them from there. So this is what a typical consumer would get if they need to replace their brake pads. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and then um, we have a question from uh, Dr. Katie Walker at HEI. She says, Break and tie wear have always been present in particulate matter and are relatively more important, she says in quotations, from the percentage contribution with the decline in tailpipe emissions. Do you have any hypotheses about the relative contribution to particle toxicity in earlier studies? Um, yeah, I'm not very sure on the toxicity side. Uh, we really come at this from the chemistry standpoint. Um, with the idea that then the people that do look at the toxicity can learn from this um, and help design, I guess, their studies. Great. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so if anybody else has any questions for Laura as we go through, um, she can answer them for you in the, um, in the Q&A box itself. Um, so thank you very much, Laura. Um, I see Shing has joined us, so we'll go on to our next speaker at this point. Um, so our next speaker is Dr. Shing Ye, who um, is currently a postdoctoral associate in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at MIT. Um, she received her joint PhD degree in chemistry and engineering and public policy from Carnegie Mellon University in 2019. Her research aims to understand the behavior of particulate matter in the atmosphere, including emissions, formation, chemical evolution, climatological and health impacts. Her research approaches um, include using mass spectrometric techniques to perform chemical analysis, mobile sampling with multi-pollutant measurements and empirical modeling of air pollution exposures. Thank you, Shing. Um, all right, uh, thank you for the introduction and I will share my screen. Can you all see my screen? It's all good? Yes. Um, okay, great, thanks. Um, hi everyone. Um, today I will share with you my doctoral research that I did at Carnegie Mellon University, looking at the spatial patterns of exposure to fine particulate matter in an urban environment. So the focus here is not only to capture exposure on the mass basis, but also to use particle number concentration and chemical mixing state to identify the sources that are responsible for a higher exposure burden. Um, this work was conducted in a Center for Air, Climate, Energy Solutions funded by US EPA. Oops. So air pollution in urban environments is often highly complicated and dynamic. As the cartoon here shows, although background level is relatively uniform across the urban scale, because of the numerous emission sources and complex landscape, the overall concentration of pollutants often show very strong spatial heterogeneities. So what a cartoon looks like in the real world is the figure on the right here. This is the work done by one of our collaborators looking at the spiritual vari variability of nitrogen monoxide in Oakland, California. And as you can see within this four kilometers by four kilometers region, uh, there's a very sharp small scale gradients in concentration due to local sources. Uh, the star in the center here is from their stationary monitoring and it's not able to capture the sharp spatial gradient. So this is NO, uh, which is a single chemical species. The story for particular matter can be more complicated. Uh, imagine you're standing in a, a downtown area. The particles you're breathing are made of those uh, background particles, which is shown in purple here, as well as those fresh emissions, such as from traffic and cooking that emit a large amount of particles from combustions. And these fresh emissions usually are much smaller in size. In contrast to downtown, if you're in a suburban area, the particles there still contain these background purple particles, but it will have a much smaller contribution from fresh emissions. 
In addition, the physical and chemical properties of the particles would also change due to processes such as dilution and chemical reactions that transform particle composition. Currently, many studies use filter-based measurements uh, as the proxy for mass exposure. And these measurements are very good for long-term monitoring, but they may not be sufficient to capture the dynamics of particles in the air, including their spatial gradients and their physical and chemical properties. So the question we try to uh, answer here is uh, for different particle metrics, such as particle mass and particle number, what are their spatial patterns of human exposure? And can we learn more if we include more particle metrics that describe particle properties in order to identify what sources are responsible for the higher exposure burden? Um, the uh, environment, uh, the urban envir environment we study is Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. The map here uh, in the center shows the population density in Allegheny County and a boundary uh, of Pittsburgh city is shown in green here. And as you can see, the majority of the population live in the city of Pittsburgh and the total population is about 300,000. If we zoom in into the city and looking at the major emission sources, uh, we find that uh, there are two major sources, traffic and restaurant cooking. And on the map uh, on the right here, each grid cell uh, is only 200 meter by 200 meter and it's color coded by the dominant sources in that grid cell. So here we can see that emission sources are highly variable on a small spatial scale. So to study how different sources are linked to PM pollution, we conducted mobile measurements in 20 neighborhoods in Pittsburgh. The sampling neighborhoods cover a broad range of land use types with different levels of source activities. The number one to number 20 neighborhoods cover location in upwind suburban area, city center, and downwind suburban areas. And we deploy our instruments on this mobile van and conducted repeated samplings to map out the pollution uh, in the city. Um, the critical instruments we use in the study is a single particle mass spectrometer. I won't, I won't go into instrument details here, but this instrument is able to provide mass and composition of total PM1 and the size and composition of each individual particles it detects. It can also count the particles. We can get particle number concentration in a size range of 50 to 1000 nanometer. And based on ion fragments these max spectra generate, uh, we're able to do source apportionment of particles and group those particles into three major categories, background particles, particles from traffic and particles from cooking. So we first look at mass concentration broken down into different sources across the urban scale. We see that overall, the PM1 mass concentration is relatively uniform across the urban scale. There are slight increases in particle mass from fresh emissions near the urban center, but because the dominant contributor on a mass basis is background particles, the spatial variation is quite small. The spatial distribution for particle number looks quite different. So here, fresh emissions from traffic and cooking plays a much larger role in particle number concentration. In the urban core region, there is a large increase in particle numbers due to fresh emissions. And because fresh particles are much smaller in size compared to background particles, they are almost invisible in mass, but reflected from a number concentration, you can see that there is a much stronger spatial variation. Using our single particle measurements, we can also derive particle mixing state. So mixing state describe uh, the, the, the distribution of different chemical species within a particle population. And here the chemical species we considered include organics, sulfate, nitrate, chloride, and black carbon. The darker the color on the map represents more internal mixing, meaning that every particle has similar composition. The red color represents external mixing, meaning that particles differ in their composition. And a pattern here suggests that in areas with higher emissions, particles are more externally mixed. We then build land use regression model to predict the concentration of particle number from traffic and cooking, as well as mixing stay for the entire city using our measurement data. Um, I won't go into details of the model modeling part here, but uh, we're able to explain about 60% or more of variability using the land use covariates. And I want to point out that we're doing a very high spatial resolution mo uh, modeling. So every grid cell here is 200 meter by 200 meter. Uh, 
The next thing we do is we combine these predicted concentration with the census data to estimate population exposure. We first look at mass exposure. Uh, as you can see here, the x-axis here is the, the PM1 mass measured by our instruments. And then on the y-axis here is the normalized cumulative population in Pittsburgh. The mass exposure first include a uniform background particles, which is about five, mil five microgram per cubic meter in Pittsburgh. Then we add in particles from traffic and cookings. Overall, the mass exposure is dominated by background particles and it, the exposure variability is less than a factor of two with respect to the background particles. For number exposure, it also first include a uniform background particles but number exposure reflects a much larger exposure variability that is driven by these fresh emissions from cooking and traffic. And some population in the city are exposed to uh, three or even five times higher than the background concentration. And lastly, we incorporated the particle mixing state into particle number exposure by color coding the total number concentration using particle mixing state number. The higher the concentration of exposure is correlated with an external mixing. A mixing state may affect toxicity of particles as different chemical species can work synergistically to enhance the adverse health effects. However, there have been very few studies to look at the effects uh, for mixing state on health. So to conclude, we use single particle measurements combined with mobile sampling to capture the spatial patterns of human exposure to particular matter in Pittsburgh. We found that particle number can uh, better reflect the spatial variability and the sources that drive the spatial variability. We also find that high exposure is uh, associated with uh, external mixing of the particles, which may have some health implications. We have published these findings uh, in two papers listed here, and you're welcome to check out the papers and uh, for more details. Um, thank you for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Sheng. Um, it looks like we have our first question from Rashid Sheikh. He asks, what is background PM? What do you know about their sources and composition? Um, what, what, what is background PM? So uh, those are the particles we identified that has a chemical fingerprint that shows those particles has undergone substantial atmospheric aging process. So uh, that's why we identified as, as background. Um, so those particles, um, they, they might come from long range transportation or, or regional backgrounds. Um, um, so here we, we just lumped them into one category to distinguish from fresh emissions from, from traffic and, and, and cooking, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, we have a second question from um, Amy Herring, who is one of our committee members, who says, thanks so much. Uh, have you looked at how the particle number co-varies with neighborhood characteristics such as social deprivation? Uh, Yes, we, we do. Uh, it, it, it was included in the paper, but I don't have time to go through that. We, oops, sorry. Uh, how do I go back? Um, we do have some uh, um, environmental justice analysis. Uh, so we do see that uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, which is not, uh, may not be representative to the entire country, uh, we do see some uh, Asian people are exposed to a higher uh, number of cooking particles compared to uh, the rest of the uh, other uh, other groups. Um, uh, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, we have a third question from Jeff Brook, who says, very nice. You've attributed PM to three sources within the city sources being traffic or cooking. Are there other sources in the city worth mentioning, for example, industry light or heavy? Uh, yes, that's that's a good question. Um, uh, we haven't done uh, so within our mobile sampling region. Uh, uh, there's not a very strong in industrial sources, but uh, in the broader region, I think in the south, there's a uh, a coke plant that uh, is a heavily uh, emitted and uh, in, in, in industrial point source. So uh, yeah, I think future studies can can do a broader survey. Uh, to figure out uh, other important uh, sources, yeah. 
but for based on our measurements, uh, the three uh, major sources are you know background particles and then uh, emissions from traffic and cooking are the really drivers for mm -hmm. the spatial variations. Yeah. Great. Okay. And I see one last question from Allison Patton at HEI. Uh, she asks, what is the importance of the mixing state of aerosols? Um, that's a very good question. Um, I can go back to the slides uh, here. So first of all, we do see the spatial variation of mixing state uh, that uh, will show, a, and it, it does correlate with higher uh, number concentration. Um, so in terms of like the health effects, um, there's have been a lack of studies that specifically look at health effects from particle of different uh, mixing state, but uh, we can, uh, uh, but I do think they will influence particle properties. For example, the hygroscopicity of the particles might change, which you think it might influence the deposition of particles in, in a human's uh, body. Um, and also, you know, different chemical species within particles, how they interact after the particle are being in the health in the body that might have some health implications there. But I think um, in general, this, this is an area that uh, 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 we need to study more. Great, thank you so much, Shing. Um, so that is the last question that I see right now. But again, if you have any further questions, um, please send them in the Q&A, um, address them directly to Shing and she can um, answer those for you um, in writing. Um, okay, so next up, um, we have Matthew Raifman. Um, so as Matthew is sharing his screen, um, Matthew is um, a PhD student in environmental health at Boston University, where he is researching the health benefits of climate and transportation policy. Prior to his PhD, Matt held a number of implementation and research roles, including launching autonomous vehicle pilots in cities at Ford Smart Mobility, advising cities on performance management and open data projects at John Hopkins University, and researching sustainable transport at the World Resources Institute. Matt received a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from Tufts University and a Master's in Public Policy from the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to uh, share some results with all of you. Um, I appreciate uh, the challenge that COVID has presented all of us, so I really appreciate the opportunity here to engage with all of you, even if it's remotely. Um, and hopefully it sparks some conversations back when we return to normal life, hopefully next year. Um, so this, uh, this presentation is focusing on quantifying the health co-benefits of climate action um, and specifically zooming in on those benefits in um, uh, the city of Boston. So um, this is coming from some research that we published earlier this year, um, environmental research letters. Um, I conducted this research with Pat Kinney, who's my advisor at BU, um, as well as some um, collaborators at Georgia Tech who conducted uh, the CMAC air, air quality modeling effort. Um, this is supported by NIH, NOAA, and NASA grants. And what we're doing in this study is examining um, the hypothetical health benefits if the city of Boston were to achieve its climate action policy goals. And so just a little bit of background um, in, a, in a limited amount of time. Um, cities across the country and really across the world are leading on climate action. I think this has become kind of a refrain um, in our circles as we talk about kind of climate action um, and government. And it's really true. I mean, whether you're looking at policies and, uh, and planning documents or whether you're looking at the establishment of greenhouse gas emissions targets and the inventories necessary to track progress or just political leadership, um, cities really are taking the initiative on this. And this isn't something that has happened just over the last couple of years. It's, it's really been building for um, a number of years, uh, maybe even a decade or more. And by one assessment, um, recent assessment, there are about 450 cities across the United States alone that have policies in place that are aimed at reducing greenhouse gas emissions, primarily CO2 emissions. And the city of Boston is, is no exception um, on, on this. So in 2016, Mayor Walsh committed uh, Boston to achieving carbon neutrality by 2050. Uh, that was backed up with a number of executive orders. Um, here are the photos you see uh, 
the signing of the executive order focused on municipal buildings. And in 2019, uh, the Carbon Free Boston plan came out, which focused on um, strategies around buildings, transportation, energy, and waste sectors. And then that was for further like formalized in a climate action plan later on in that year in 2019. And the reason why these plans are interesting from a health perspective is their climate action plans ostensibly focused on uh, greenhouse gas emissions and uh, mitigating the impacts and sometimes adapting to the impacts of climate change. And so they're primarily strategies focused on greenhouse gas emissions, but through the co-benefits framework, you can see how those greenhouse gas emission strategies would also likely reduce demand for fossil fuels. Um, we see this in primarily the coal and natural gas sector, at least in the Northeast, when it comes to the power, power generation for buildings, industry, and, and commercial interests. And then, of course, with oil, when it comes to petroleum consumption for automobiles. And that reduction in demand for fossil fuels is where we may see improvements in air quality. Um, in this research, we look at specifically PM 2.5 and ozone, but we could include other uh, pollutants as well. Um, and it's from those changes in air quality really impacts to health from mortality and morbidity. And so just to kind of sum it up, you, you can see how policies and plans that are focused ostensibly on greenhouse gas emissions are likely to actually impact health through this indirect mechanism of improved air quality from fossil fuel consumption reduction. And I won't, I won't dwell too long here because I suspect uh, many in the, in the room uh, have contributed to these studies and are very familiar with them or have even advanced further. Uh, but suffice it to say, there's uh, considerable research supporting the relationship between uh, PM 2.5 and ozone with adverse health effects, um, both within mortality and as well as a number of morbidity outcomes. So for this, for this project, our objective was to look at um, what might be the hypothetical health benefits from air quality improvements if the city of Boston were to eliminate all anthropogenic emissions originating from within its borders. And so to do this, what we did is devise two different scenarios. In the first scenario, we, we model the current air quality across the region. Um, in the second model, we take that, that same scenario one, um, the current air quality, but we eliminate anthropogenic emissions originating from the city of Boston. And so the difference between these two scenarios is our estimate of the impacts of the elimination of anthropogenic emissions from Boston across the entire region. And we do this using CMAC for air quality modeling across a 120 kilometer by 120 kilometer domain centered on the city of Boston. Um, each of those 900 grid squares that you see in the visualization are four kilometer by four kilometer um, inner domains. And the 12 uh, red boxes there are the, one, are the domains, uh, are the inner domain boxes that are overlapping with the city of Boston. And so those are the ones where we eliminated anthropogenic emissions in our scenario two. So the approach here is fairly straightforward, I think. Um, using CMAC, we modeled um, air pollution concentrations or air quality concentrations for the base case and the zero emission scenarios. We then calculated the difference between those two uh, using R and then plugged in those values into US EPA BenMap, which is a benefits mapping tool for estimating health impacts and their monetary valuation using the rulemaking uh, literature that supports a lot of EPA's work. And the, the method employed by BenMap is a concentration response function um, again, fairly straightforward relating uh, the change in air quality for PM 2.5 and separately ozone to um, estimate health impacts for a number of different endpoints. We looked at mortality as well as 10 different uh, morbidity endpoints. So each of those have their own baseline incidence or prevalence um, that plugs into this function. We estimate health impacts at the county level, um, owning to uh, the availability of uh, race stratified um, population data. Uh, as well as just the ease of doing that within BenMap. So first, um, with results, I'll share the air quality impacts and then move on to the health impacts. So what you see here on the left are the change in PM 2.5 concentrations across the region and on the right, ozone concentrations. Note, this is the change. So these are not the before and after, this is the delta between the two. Um, in both cases, 
results are fairly, or air, air quality um, changes are fairly concentrated in the Boston area. Um, there are notably impacts across the entire region. Um, looking at PM 2.5 for a second, we see the max um, change in downtown Boston, which is about a halving of, um, of air quality uh, of PM 2.5 concentrations. Um, on the right side with ozone, you see a more complicated relationship owning to the fact that there's an ozone sink that's occurring um, with NOx emissions uh, and, uh, and oxygen in the atmosphere. And I won't go into too much detail, but I'm happy to talk about more in questions. Um, I'm not an atmospheric chemist, but what's happening here is essentially in high NOx environments and high pollution environments like downtown Boston, um, there's actually a, an effect that's happening where we're sequestering some of the ozone. And so when you remove anthropogenic emissions from the city of Boston, you're actually, you're losing that, that sink. And so you're seeing an increase in ozone concentrations uh, estimated around the city of Boston where NOx emissions would be highest. And so uh, moving into the health impacts. So first mortality, we estimate about 290 net deaths we avoided across the domain per year, uh, valued at across all um, outcomes that would be valued at $2.4 billion of savings per year, about 1% of, um, of gross uh, uh, counting product um, for the region. Um, what's, what's interesting here is to note that the effects are concentrated in Suffolk County where Boston's located, but you do see mortality benefits um, across the entire region. And I think that's one of the key takeaways of this paper and this analysis is that the actions that a city like Boston undertakes may actually have impacts across the entire region. And that's notable and important to include when we're considering these types of policies. Uh, moving on into morbidity endpoints, we estimate actually 10, as I mentioned, just a few of those that I, I wanted to point out were fewer heart attacks, work days loss, asthma exacerbation, and minor restricted activity days across the entire domain. And finally, um, using CDC Wonder race and ethnicity stratified data for baseline mortality, we were able to estimate population adjusted benefits um, across different race and ethnicities. And the thing to take away here that's interesting is that non-Hispanic black people would benefit about three times as much from the elimination of anthropogenic emissions in Boston across the domain as non-Hispanic white. And this is a factor of, of really two things. One is the concentration of air quality benefits in Boston. And the second is the relative diversity of Boston compared to the rest of the domain. But I don't think that diminishes the potential environmental uh, justice benefits of, um, of climate action, particularly when it's in areas of historical environmental injustice like the city of Boston. And so that's another main conclusion that I wanted to highlight out of this research. So with that, I'll, I'll stop there. I see a couple chats already popping up and I wanna leave some time for questions. Thank you. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, so we have um, our first two questions. Um, our first three questions are from Alan Robinson. Um, the first is a clarifying question. Uh, he asks, changes in emissions were just in your domain or also outside your domain adjusted, say, through your boundary conditions? Sorry, um, they're modeled just in the domain for this analysis. Okay, great, thank you. Um, Alan's second question is, what is the social cost of HTCO2 emissions reduced? How does it compare to the 2 billion estimate health benefits? Great question. Um, we did not model that in this paper, mm -hmm. um, but it would be a good extension, I think. Yeah. Um, Alan's third question is, uh, are there potential synergies to co-designing air quality and climate policies since they share sources? Yes, absolutely. And that's kind of one of the takeaways here is that we need to be a little bit more holistic or we benefit as a society if we're more holistic about the benefits of these types of policies. Um, so that's definitely, uh, yeah, a, a key takeaway that I'd agree with. Great, okay. Um, I don't see any further questions um, at this point. Feel uh, free, please, to submit any more if you have them, um, but also please um, continue to submit questions for Matt in the Q&A, which he will answer for you um, in writing. Um, thank you very much, Matt. We, um, oh, we do have one final question um, and a few more minutes if you'd like to answer that. So um, this is a question from Jana Milford who asks, are the environmental justice results sensitive to the resolution of the modeling study? 
That's a good question. I'm thinking about it. Um, I think they're mo they're not necessarily, but they are sensitive to um, the subset of the of the domain that you consider. So what's notable there is the environmental justice benefits, if you just focused on the city of Boston, would be would be less substantial because it's a relatively diverse area compared to the rest of the domain. And that may be what you're getting at with the question too. But like, so if you just looked at Suffolk County, for example, where, it's, where most of the benefits are concentrated, um, there is still some environmental justice benefits, but it's not as substantial as a 3X benefit. Whereas if you look at the entire domain and include less diverse areas of the domain, like um, further Western in Massachusetts, uh, that, that delta, the difference between white and non-Hispanic black, for example, increases. So it is sensitive to which subset of the domain you look at. Great, thank you. Um, I see that that is um, not a question, but a comment um, by Alan Robinson in the chat. Um, I think we will need to move on to our next speaker, but um, Matt can engage with you um, in the Q&A on that one, Alan. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so next we move on to Dr. Yun Lin. Um, who is currently a postdoctoral associate in Jim Zhang's lab at Duke Global Health Institute. With a biomarker approach, Yan's research aims to illustrate the impact of air pollution on population exposure to toxic chemicals and subsequent health effects. He received his PhD in environmental health sciences at UCLA, where his research focused on the early cardiovascular effects of air pollution. His current research aims to elucidate the pathophysiologic mechanisms by which air pollution causes adverse, adverse birth outcomes. Thank you, Jan. Thanks, Joanna, for the introduction. Uh, it's of my great pleasure to present our Bell monitoring work in a group of travelers from Los Angeles to Beijing. In this work, our focus will be air pollution, exposure to polyaromatic hydrocarbon, and early cardiovascular effects. Air pollution is a global health problem. There is 87% of global population living with unhealthy air, and ambient particle matter pollution has caused up to 9 million deaths worldwide. I want to emphasize that there is a huge spatial variation in the level of ambient air pollution levels. For example, the annual average PM2.5 exposure in China was more than five folds higher than that of the United States, which caused much more actual deaths among local residents of China. Although the air pollution level in the United States was relatively lower as compared with many other countries, there are 30 million US residents traveling outbound every year, and many of them travel to a city or country with severe air pollution. However, it is largely unknown whether a short-term visit to a polluted city would cause any adverse health effect. And more importantly, if yes, whether the effect is reversible after they return to their home country or cities. To answer this question, we have performed a natural experiment between UCLA, based on a summer exchange program between UCLA and the Peking University of China. In this program, about 10 to 15 students from UCLA will travel to Beijing for 10 weeks and stay there, uh, will travel to Beijing and stay there for 10 weeks. We have recruited those students from year 2014 to 2017 and collect their urine and blood samples before, during, and after their 10 weeks stay in Beijing for biomarker analysis. The figure here shows the change of ambient PM2.5 levels in the study period, and the gray area indicates the data in Beijing. Clearly, we can see that the ambient PM2.5 level in Beijing was significantly and consistently higher than Los Angeles before and after the travel. Interesting, if we focus on the air pollution level in Beijing, there appears to be a continuous decline trend from 2014 to 2017. This is likely driven by the air pollution control actions by the Chinese government. As the first step of this study, we examine whether Traveling to more pollutant Beijing has increased the personal exposure to toxic air pollutant. Here we focus on exposure to PAH because there are a group of chemicals mainly came from major air pollution sources such as vehicle emission. 
as well as have higher toxicity as group one carcinogens. In this study, we evaluate personal exposure to pH based on the measurement of pH metabolites in the urine. We found that traveling from Los Angeles to Beijing has significantly increased the urine metabolites of pH. Of pH. And the exposure returned to the baseline level after participants traveling back to Los Angeles. The urinary pH metabolites level in Beijing, as indicated by the orange boxes, was continuously declined from 2014 to 2017, which is consistent with the trend of ambient air pollution level. Actually, the urinary pH metabolites level was significantly and positively associated with ambient NO2 and the PM2.5 level in Beijing. After confirming increased exposure to pH in Beijing, we further investigate whether the exposure will cause any adverse health effects. Here, we focus on early cardiovascular effects because cardiovascular disease is the major, is, is the primary cause of premature death in induced air pollution. It's important to note that for most cardiovascular disease or subclinical event atherosis, it always takes several years for them to develop. So a short-term visit to a polluted city is unlikely to induce observable changes in this in those endpoints. Nevertheless, the early pathological events contributing to the formation of atherosis, such as systemic oxidation and inflammation, will occur rapidly after short-term exposure to air pollution, even in healthy people. The inducement of systemic oxidation and the inflammation is a result of imbalance between pro- and anti-inflammatory and oxidative responses. In our study, the main focus will be a group of pro-oxidative and pro-inflammatory enzymes, namely LOX, as well as a protective enzyme on one. The importance of both enzymes has been well documented in previous animal and human studies, which linked the initiation of atherosis to the upregulation of LOX as well as the inhibition of TOM1 activity. Another panel of animal study also shown that more than two weeks exposure to air pollution could upregulate LOX, LOX pathways and inhibited TOM1 activities and therefore contribute to the formation of atherosis. In human controlled exposure experiment, however, two hours exposure to air pollution didn't change the level of activity of POM1 or LOX matters. And the likely reason here is two hours exposure may, might be too short to induce observable changes in human beings. For most of the traveler to a polluted city, the typical exposure duration range from several days to several weeks allowing us to examine whether longer-term exposure to air pollution will modulate both enzymes. To test this hypothesis, we have measured a panel of circulating biomarker indicative of changes in LOX and the power activities. We found that the LOX matters was increased while the power matters were decreased after traveling from Los Angeles to Beijing. And the changes of both group of biomarker was recovered after participant traveling back to Los Angeles. We also measured a panel of cardiovascular biomarker that was widely that was widely used at clinics or in previous epidemiology studies. We found traveling to Beijing has increased the circul circulating level of etasoprostin, C reactive protein, and but it didn't alter cholesterol levels. All these results suggest the increased risk of cardiovascular disease in Beijing, likely due to systemic inflammation and oxidation. We further found that the biomarker of inflammation and the oxidation was significantly associated with urinary biomarker of pH. On the other hand, we also evaluate other exposures, such as secondhand smoke, emotional stress and dietary factors. However, none of those factors was associated with the cardiovascular biomarker. In this regard, we believe the observed cardiovascular effects are likely due to the changes in air pollution levels 
during the travel. In summary, this sounds about monitor of international travelers. We, we found that travel from less polluted Los Angeles to more polluted Beijing will increase the personal exposure to pH. And in associated with increased the pH exposure, travel to, traveling to Beijing has also induced the systemic oxidation and inflammation, suggesting increased risk of cardiovascular disease. The good news is all the changes in explorer and health biomarkers will reverse after returning to a clean areas. I want to acknowledge uh, the supervision of my uh, advisor, Dr. Yifan Zhu from UCLA, as well as substantial contribution from my colleagues in both universities. And this work was funded by NIHS, NIHS, NSF of China, and the UCLA Center for Occupational and Environmental Health. Thanks for, intro, uh, thanks for the attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Yan. Um, okay, looking at the Q&A, we have a question from Alan Robinson. He says, super cool. Is there any other possible exposure pathways beyond air that might cause these changes? Air seems likely for PAH markers. What about the less compound specific ones? Uh, yes, I, I, th I think we do measure other uh, factors such as the, as mentioned, such as the, the emotional stress and the uh, cortisol level, as well as some battery biomarker. So we do observe some uh, uh, effects of secondhand smoke on some non-endomatic oxidation pathways. But for the major endpoints such as LOX and POM1 pathways, secondhand smoke didn't have any effects on those uh, endpoints. So we believe all the changes are driven by air pollution. And on the other hand, the emotional stress as well as the battery factor shows no effect on the biomarker we studied. Great, okay. Um, not a question, but um, a comment from Jeff Brook, um, who says very convincing work. Um, I don't see um, any further questions at this point, but um, please, um, we, here we go. We have one further question um, from Rashid Sheikh, who asks, what about changes in food? Uh, yes, we, we didn't uh, uh, use questionnaire or uh, nutrition uh, questionnaire to, to, to survey their uh, food diet. But we use a metabolomic approach to measure the nutrition in their blood to see whether there are significant changes in any nutrition. And we do find biomarker changes of uh, changes in the food intake between the two sources. Uh, but furthermore, we, as mentioned before, we didn't find an association with those markers with the house of present with um, way the battery becomes the Great, okay, we have um, another question. Um, this one is from Jeff Brook. He asks, uh, is there a greater prevalence of atherosclerosis in Beijing versus LA given what is seen here? Uh, this is a very good question. I don't have an accurate number about the prevalence of, of atherosis, but I do see some literatures about the prevalence of uh, chronic cardiovascular disease. And surprisingly, it seems that the prevalence in the United States was even higher than that of China. I believe this is because some uh, lifestyle factors, such as some uh, the, 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 especially for the diet habit, can also modulate the, 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 also influence the prevalence of cardiovascular disease. But in our study, this, these factors are strictly controlled, so it's not influenced the effects of air pollution. Great, okay. Um, another um, question from Tanya Alderetta. She asks, related, were you able to account for changes in physical activity? And she says, great presentation. Thank you. Uh, I think the, the, we do use questionnaire to survey the physical activity. And there is a very interesting part in the changes of their physical activity. For example, uh, the particip participants tend to spend more time cooking in Los Angeles, but spend less time driving outdoors in Los Angeles as compared with space. And this is because once they get to go to a new city, they typically have some higher motivation to go outside to see, to explore something new. And also in, the, in Beijing, they didn't have an opportunity to, to, to live in their homes, so they cannot cook very much. And all these factors at least partially contributed to the variation in the, in the pH exposure. Yeah, I think this is, um, it was, I think it was 
to get this right. Thank you. Okay, we have um, two more questions that hopefully you can answer relatively quickly. The first um, is from Pallavi Pant at HEI. She says, given the results you saw in this study, are you planning to expand the analysis, probably post COVID? How might we use this information? Uh, yeah, we, we do keep uh, expanding the biomarker analysis to this work. Uh, for example, uh, we now we, 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 we too found some uh, uh, some results showing the, the inducement of systemic inflammation and oxidation. But later on, we want to further clarify what's the, what's the mechanism and, and, and what's the target and how those different biomarker interact to further promote such a phenomenon. Great, okay, and I think we have time um, to address our last question, which is from Sarah Styler. She says, I'm curious about how PAH metabolite levels correlate to PAH exposure. Is there person-to-person -person variation in the efficiency of processing in the body? Uh, that's a great question. I, I, I think, uh, for, first, I want to clarify that in our study and our data cannot answer this question. But uh, based on previous literature, I think the answer is yes, there should be any person to person variation in the in the in the metabolize, uh, metabolization and the, the excretion of pH exposure. But in our study, the good thing is every subject can serve as its own control so that this uh, effect could be minimal. Wonderful. Okay, thank you so much, Jan. Um, we will move on to our next speaker at this point. Um, so next up, we have Dr. Jia Yuan Wang, um, who is a postdoctoral fellow at University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, there we go. Okay. Um, working with Dr. Rafael Aku. Her research interests include air pollution and its health effects in low and middle income countries. In Dr. Aku's lab, her current focus is understanding air pollution and population exposures in rapidly ur urbanizing Accra, the capital of Ghana in West Africa. Jia Yuan received her PhD from the Institute of Earth Environment, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Her doctoral research was focused on understanding haze formation mechanisms in Northern China. Okay, uh, thank you, um, Joanna, for the introduction. Um, so hello, everyone. Uh, very happy and honored to be here today to present our latest result on the spatial temporal variation and sources of nitrogen oxide in Accra, Ghana. So uh, different from our previous um, presenter, which are mostly focused on the particulate matter, nitrogen oxides, often called NOx, are a, gas, a group of gas pollutants that contain seven compounds. And within them, um, nitric oxide, NO, and nitrogen dioxide, NO2, are the most prevalent species. So most of the uh, NOx comes from uh, combustory, combustion related emission from either um, fossil fuel combustion or biomass burning. And in the city of developed country where cars are the predominant emission source, uh, NOx are often used as tracer for traffic. And as their health effects, NOx can directly cause respiratory infections and indirectly, NOx can react in the atmosphere to form ozone and PM. Both are well-known uh, air pollutants and that can cause severe health issue. So the WHO has guideline for NO2 and the annual mean concentration limit level is 40 microgram per cubic meter. So a little bit of background for our study region. Um, Sub-Saharan Africa cities now are among the most polluted region in the world due to the unplanned and uh, rapid uh, urban growth. So the air pollution has now become their biggest public health issue. And it is characterized by complex local emission source, sources such as open trash burning, like unregulated traffic and intensive biomass burning for cooking. Meanwhile, uh, it is also largely influenced regionally from Sahara Desert during the dusty Hamilton season, which is normally from November to next March. And on top of that, uh, in the whole Af West Africa, there is no long-term monitoring system for the air, pol air pollution, especially for the NOx. So Accra, which is our campaign city, is the capital of Ghana. It has re uh, expanded remarkably in the last two decades. So the population increased almost three times 
from 1.7 to 5 million since 2000, and the vehicle number increased almost six times from 2005 to 2015. Uh, meanwhile, uh, around half of the population are still using biomass as their, as their uh, daily energy use. So in contrasting to the city of developed country where uh, cars are the predominant source of uh, NOx, um, in the setting of Accra with increasing number of vehicles and intensive uh, biomass. So we want to know whether traffic or biomass burning is more important source for NOx. So to answer this question, we conducted a one year campaign um, in Accra, greater Accra metropolitan area, we call it Gamma. So here is the map of Africa and the pink purple area is the country Ghana and the black line outlined our uh, campaign region Gamma. So we sampled from last July to this June and we used the Ogava passive sampler to collect it both NO2 and uh, NO. Uh, and we divided our site into two big category. The first one is fixed site, which are shown here as the orange triangle. And we have 10 of them. Each one lasted one year and we changed the filter weekly. And they are meant to capture the seasonal changes. And the next type is rotating site, which are the um, blue dots over here. And we have 140 of them. Each one operated only one week and they are meant to capture the special variations. And uh, we further divided all the sites into four categories based on their land use and socioeconomic status. So the first one is commercial business industry, we call it CBI site, and they're more representing traffic. And the next one is high density residential HD site, and they're more represent um, biomass burning. Um, so next is medium low density residential LD site. And the last one is peri-urban background UB site. So let's look at the results. So here are the maps um, of both NO on the upper panel and NO2 on the lower panel. Um, um, and the different color represents the different concentration level. So as we can see, there is large spatial variations within gamma and the average uh, concentration in gamma for NO is 39 microgram per cubic meter and NO2 is 50, which is above the WHO guideline. And this figure shows the NOx level at each rotating site and which is color and the color representing the different site types. As uh, we can see, this dash line here is the WHO guideline for NO2 and about 60% of our sites exceeded that. Um, and uh, finally, site, uh, site type wise, um, the CBI has the highest concentration, higher than um, the HD and LD, and the background was the lowest. So as we mentioned previously, we want to know whether traffic or biomass burning is more important source for NOx in gamma. So we, we conducted a um, correlation analysis between the NOx uh, and uh, the distance between each site to the major road, which are shown uh, at, on the y, uh, x axis. So as shown here on the plot A and C, uh, as the distance increase, the NOx concentration decreased dramatically, um, especially within the 500 meters, if we zoom in as shown on the B and D plot. However, uh, we did not uh, notice any correlation between NOx and the biomass use at the enumeration area level. So we conclude that the traffic is still the most important source for NOx in the gamma. So here next is temporal variation. Here are two um, time series of both NO and NO2 that are coded by uh, the site type. And this gray area here is the Hamilton season. As we can see, there's little change um, for the NO across all site type throughout the whole campaign. However, there was a significant increase for NO2 during the Hamilton season. Um, so because there's no change for NO, which means that the primary emission did not change much. However, the uh, NO2, uh, suddenly increased. So we want to know, we, we, uh, so which made us to think that 
may, maybe this increase was associated with meteorology meteorology changes, and we later come that and we later found out um, a strong correlation be, uh, between the NO2 and its ratio over NOx uh, with two um, meteorological uh, parameters, which are uh, mixing layer depths uh, shown on the A and B and solar radiation shown on the uh, plot C and D. Um, so, we conduct, uh, so we conclude that uh, local pollution level was likely enhanced due to the lowering of the mixing layer depth. And so secondary formation was likely promoted by higher solar radiation during the Hamilton season. So to sum up, uh, about 60% uh, of our sites exceeded the WHO guideline for annual mean of uh, NO2, and traffic is still the most important source for NOx in Gamma. Lastly, uh, local pollution level was likely enhanced due to the meteorology changes during the Hamilton season. Uh, and finally, I want to acknowledge the path we project for supporting our campaign and uh, many thanks to my PI, Dr. Rafael Arku and our team member, Sarah and Sira. And uh, our um, study cannot be done with our amazing field team, uh, James, Joseph, and, and Salam. And with that, I'm happy to take any question. Great, thank you so much. Um, so our first question um, is from Jeff Brook, uh, who says, thank you. What does Harmaton mean? Something inherently to do with season or climate. He says, always great to learn about what seems to be a cultural thing. Where does the word Harmaton come from? Yes, that's a very good question. Um, so yeah, let me show the slide that I prepared. So Hamilton is definitely a unique season um, for the West Africa and Central Africa, those region. So, um, so the Hamilton is like the dry season and during the Hamilton, the time as shown here, the temperature is higher, relative humidity is lower. And uh, um, because, and this two plots show the air mass trajectory uh, from non-Hamilton and Hamilton, as we can see, um, during the non-Hamilton season, almost all the air, um, like 99% of the air was coming from ocean direction. While during the Hamilton season, uh, more than half of the air was coming from the Central Africa where the desert is. So the reason why it called Hamilton is because during this period of time, it normally have like some really severe um, dust, uh, dusty dust storm. Um, so yeah, that's that's what about Hamilton, and it definitely has big influence um, for those region. Great, thank you so much. Um, I don't see any further questions at this point. Please, um, uh, attendees, if you have any further questions for GIU one, um, please submit them um, in the Q and A. Um, we do have one um, question from Pallavi Pant at HEI. She says. Um, this is interesting. Are you also conducting similar, similar analyses for other pollutants? Uh, yes, actually, uh, we do collect a PM 2.5 and also we analyze the uh, black carbon, but um, that was uh, our team member Sarah's work. And so I did not present here, but yes, we do have PM 2.5 and BC. Yeah, that's about all we measured. Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question from Abraham Aslami who says, what do we know about NOx limited slash VOC limited regime in the area? Um, that's a very good question. Um, so we don't have data. So uh, yeah, VOC and NOx, that's very important relation in the uh, atmospheric chemistry, but unfortunately we don't have uh, VOC data in this region. So I cannot really answer the question, but that's definitely uh, interesting for our future work. Yeah. Uh, great, thank you so much. Um, okay, um, if you have any further questions for GAU1, please um, submit those in the Q&A box um, and 
um, she will um, get back to you on those. We do have one more question um, that you can answer for us right now, though, from mm -hmm. Carla Bossad, who says, um, what is the best thing that government leaders could do to improve the air quality, improve traffic flow or improve filtering on engines? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so uh, I think both. And so uh, the in Accra, uh, the difference is most of the vehicles in this region are second-hand and imported that abandoned cars that from uh, imported from developed country. So within the last three years, the government has implemented uh, like uh, emission limit uh, restrictions. Um, such as lower the sulfur content and also uh, ad adoption the euro for vehicle emission standard. Um, that's that's all necessary and needed. And um, by our result, I think more take key point from our result is I think um, not only uh, for those emission limits, we also want to. Uh, uh, pointing out the importance uh, stringent emission policy during the Hamilton season, I think um, policymakers should uh, pay more attention to that. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, we will move on to our last speaker of the day. Um, we have Dr. Fanaz Fuladi who received her PhD in pharmaceutical sciences from North Dakota State University, where she studied the role of the gut microbiome on weight outcomes after gastric bypass surgery. As a postdoctoral fellow at University of North Carolina at Charlotte, she extended her research to characterize the link between the gut microbiome and human disease, including obesity and eating disorders. Recently, she has begun to study the impact of environmental exposures on the structure and function of the gut microbiome as a potential risk factor for obesity and type 2 diabetes. Overall, Dr. Fuladi's research uses cutting edge bioinformatics and genomics tools to conduct big data analysis. Thanks for the nice introduction and for this great opportunity to present my research, which involves uh, studying the association between air pollution exposure and the gut microbiome as relieved by shotgun metagenomic sequencing. So we all know that uh, air pollution has a, a significant impact on human health. And most of disease burden from air pollution results from uh, cardiovascular diseases, respiratory diseases, and lung cancer. In addition to all these well-known effects, some studies have also linked air pollution to obesity and type 2 diabetes. For example, in adults, increased air pollution exposure, such as NOx and O2 and particulate matter, were associated with greater risk for obesity and type 2 diabetes. Also, increased annual and short-term exposure to NO2 and PM had adverse effect on fasting glucose and insulin sensitivity. In addition, in children, uh, increased air pollution exposure was asso associated with increased BMI, increased insulin resistance, and declined insulin sensitivity and beta cell function. The mechanisms through which air pollution could contribute to obesity and type 2 diabetes are not very well known. However, some studies have suggested that increased inflammation and alteration in basal metabolism and adipose tissues could mediate some effects of air pollution on human health. In addition, exposure to air pollutant could uh, change gut microbiome composition, which would ultimately contribute to development of obesity and type 2 diabetes. In fact, uh, there is a growing body of evidence in literature that suggests that the gut microbiome uh, contribute to obesity uh, through changes in fermentation of nutrients and increased energy harvest from diet. In addition, the gut microbiome can affect multiple organs and tissues in our body. For example, it can decrease satiety in the brain, it can increase inflammation in the liver, and it can uh, increase uh, fat accumulation in adipose tissues. A question that may arise here is how uh, air pollutants can affect the gut microbiome. In fact, there are several ways for interaction between air pollutants and the gut microbiome. 
For example, ultra fine particles can be inhaled and diffused from lungs into blood uh, systemic cir circulation and then reach the intestine through the bloodstream. Also, air pollutants can be inhaled and then cleared from the airways by cilia and then ingested. And finally, air pollutants can reach the intestine through ingestion of contaminated food and water. In our study, we question whether air pollution exposure, exposure can uh, change the gut microbiome in young adults. To answer this question, we access to exposure data in overweight and obese young adults. In addition, we, had, uh, we provided a detailed assessment of the gut microbiome using whole genome sequencing. We hypothesized that higher exposure to air pollutants would be associated with specific gut bacteria and also alterations in gut bacterial function. And that means changes in functional genes and pathways. Our study was part of a Southern California Children's Health Study and participants underwent clinical assessment uh, between 2014 and 17 and age range was between uh, 17 and 21. Individual residential ambient, ambient air pollution was quantified using air quality stations using inverse distance squared weighting. And individual residential near roadway air pollution was quantified using California line dispersion model. And finally, the gut microbiome was characterized using whole genome sequencing and multivariate and univariate linear models were used to study the association between the gut microbiome and air pollutants. So uh, on this slide, you can see the results from a multivariate analysis. And you can see that several um, air pollutants such as NOx and O2 and ozone were significantly were associated with microbiome at the phylum level. Other demographic variables such as sex, BMI, and age were not significantly associated with the gut microbiome. Ozone exposure explained the largest variation in our data around 11% and remained, this association um, was remained significant even at the species level. So this analysis suggests that there might be some associations between the gut microbiome and air pollutants. However, it doesn't show uh, which bacteria or taxa are specifically associated with air pollutants. To answer this question, we uh, performed univariate um, linear regression for each bacterium. And we observed that ozone had the most significant associations with a number of taxa at the phylum level. We performed similar analyses on other taxonomic levels and these associations were uh, remained significant at the species level as well. Among all the taxa that were associated with ozone, maybe the most interesting one is bacteroides since it's very high abundance in our gut. And from this scatter plot, we can see that increased ozone exposure was associated with increased relative abundance of bacteroides. And this association was also observed at the species level. And all these significant association that we observed were remained significant after um, controlling for confounding factors such as um, age, BMI, or sex, or season. And another interesting observation from our diet was that increased uh, ozone exposure was significantly associated with decreased Shannon diversity index, which was the measurement for richness and uh, evenness. That means how many bacteria are in the gut and how they are abundant they are. And this could have an important clinical implication because some studies have shown that decreased bacterial diversity are associated with poor health outcomes. Since we performed whole genome sequencing, we could also study the association between uh, air pollutants and functional pathways. And similar to taxonomic compositions, we observed that ozone exposure were significantly associated with a number of functional pathways. And this is important because enrichment of some of these pathways could potentially impact the gut permeability. For example, L-ornithine de novo biosynthesis, 
can reg regulate synthesis of uh, polyamines and nitric acid, which are involved in cell growth and proliferation, and therefore could potentially affect the gut permeability. Another pathway which was significantly associated was ozone, was pantothenate and, and coenzyme A biosynthesis, which can regulate fatty acid synthesis and degradation, and therefore it can potentially impact the gut permeability. In addition, coenzyme derivatives can inhibit insulin release and therefore uh, could contribute to development of type 2 diabetes and obesity. And uh, since the main uh, finding from our study was a significant association between ozone and air pollutants, um, the question here, here is uh, what the mechanism for this effect? And some studies have proposed that uh, ozone can activate uh, the HPA axis in the brain, which uh, stimulates release of catecholamines and straight hormones. And these biomolecules can release into systemic circulation and reach into the intestine. And from there, it can affect intestinal immune system, intestinal permeability, and uh, also the gut microbiome. Uh, we are also interested in metabolomics, and uh, currently we are studying association between targeted and untargeted metabolites and air pollution exposure. And we are hoping that the results from our study uh, would shed light on mechanisms through which exposure to air pollutants could contribute to obesity or uh, type 2 diabetes in young children. And uh, with this, I would like to thank uh, all collaborators who significantly contributed to this research and also funding source. And finally, thanks all for uh, listening and I would be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you so much, Fanas. Um, so our first question is from Jeff Brook, um, who asks, what is the rationale for considering ozone as well as the other pollutants with a one year lag? So uh, we hypothesize that uh, long-term uh, exposure to air pollutants can, could uh, have a, a more impact effect uh, on uh, gut microbiome because these changes or fluctuations that happen in gut microbiome maybe take some time to happen. And we also accessed to uh, one month exposure air pollutant and uh, we didn't uh, observe such effect when we are using uh, one month exposure. Great, thank you. Um, I don't see any further questions in the Q&A. Do we have um, any further questions for Fonaz in the, um, from the participants? Uh, we can, um, again, you can um, submit questions that Fanaz can um, type directly to you or possibly follow up with you um, by email. Um, we do have one um, further question um, from Jeff Brook, who says, ozone correlates with other spatial variables like less NO2 or more greenness. Could the vegetation be a source? Uh, that could be, uh, that's a really good question, and it could be a possibility that uh, could be, you know, other factors could be, uh, confound, act as confounding factors. And uh, what we did is uh, we uh, also built some uh, multi pollutant models to control for, for example, the confounding effect of NO2. And still, when we um, um, control for them, um, this, the significant result that we were found, still they were significant. However, um, you know, future studies, maybe more longitudinal studies or uh, more animal studies could help to control for other factors. Thank you, yeah. Um, so we have another question from um, Alan Robinson who says, what is known about gut microbiome and things like diabetes? Uh, several studies have shown that uh, the gut microbiome uh, composition is changed in diabetes. Uh, there are some conflicting results in one taxa would be responsible, but some consistent results are also found. And in general, um, changes in gut microbiome can, um, induce a chronic inflammation, which, um, or for example, it can change intestinal permeability or um, 
um, mostly it's because of the inflammation that it may uh, produce in body could uh, result in diabetes. Um, great, thank you so much. So um, if there are any further questions for Fanaz, I see that she has um, her email address up on the screen. So please feel free to email her. Um, Fanaz, if I could ask you to stop sharing your screen at that po this point, thank you. Um, okay, well, thank you so much and congratulations to all of our presenters um, and thank you to all of our attendees for joining us today. Um, although we wish we had been able to meet with all of you in person at the conference, um, we are so glad we got the chance to hear about their research today. Um, so all of today's, webin uh, today's webinar attendees will receive a short survey in your inboxes tomorrow. Um, and if you have a few minutes, we would love to hear your feedback on today's webinar, um, as well as any topics that you would be interested in hearing us cover in the future. Uh, we also hope that you will join us for future events and webinars, including our annual conference in April next year. You can sign up for newsletters on our website and follow us on social media for updates on future events and research. And with that, thank you very much for attending and good evening.